Yes, and that is all dependent not only on the sizing and design of the system, but the management of the system. And all systems are different, and all um, gravity systems are at different slopes, different velocities. There's different peak, um, peak flows during um, different purposes or different events. And so you, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to a lot of the issues we're seeing in certain um, collection systems. It's just you cannot make one general statement with that because if a system is um, well maintained and well operated and rehabilitated when necessary, um, you should not find those, those problems. It's actually a matter of the agency keeping up with the necessary capacity for those peak flows and how it needs to be managed. So I'm going to continue with uh, the presentation. In, when looking at the region-specific information, uh, in terms of the high number of SSOs by region, we noticed that uh, the Central Valley uh, in Sacramento, uh, the San Francisco Bay region, and the LA region accounted for the most SSOs reported to the database. It's important to note that these three uh, regions combined account to more than 50% of the uh, publicly owned sewer system in the state. In terms of the volume reported by, by and released within regions, we noticed that, again, the San Francisco Bay and the Central Valley in Fresno um, accounted to the most volume uh, reported in the state. Um, this could be an indication, again, of influent infiltration issues and infrastructure issues. In terms of the Central Valley Fresno, um, well, drove that high volume during the past fiscal year was a one-time high volume SSO. I'm going to move on to compliance with some of the requirements of the uh, general order. In terms of the sewer system management plan compliance, all uh, uh, s uh, sewer system management plans were uh, uh, due by uh, August of 20 2012 and um, sorry I was 2010 and for the past year we noticed that 93 percent of all the enrolled uh, sewer systems completed their uh, sewer system management plan and I'm going to go over some of the activities we have taken to take to look into those seven percent that haven't uh, uh, completed uh, their sewer system management plan uh, on its entirety or ha only have completed certain sections of their sewer system management plan. Moving on in terms of the monthly reporting, as I mentioned before, and release are required to submit uh, reports of all SSOs um, reported within, and they need to be reported to the database. And for those uh, sewer systems or a release that do not have an SSO for a particular month, they're still required to submit a no spill certification for a particular month. During the past fiscal year, 92% of the enrollees were in compliance with their monthly reporting. And to address the remaining 8% that are lagging behind in compliance, we uh, implemented uh, an email reminder that is sent on a monthly basis to remind them that there's issues in their reporting. Moving on to em compliance and enforcement activities we have taken um, uh, in response to those 7% of enrollees that haven't completed their sewer system management plan, we sent 148 notices of violation uh, to those enrollees. And 86% um, we of those enrollees uh, came back into compliance. They completed their uh, the sewer system management plan and certified in the database that they had completed it. There were eight enrollees that requested additional time and uh, we're still working with them to, to get them into compliance. Uh, there were 12 non-responsive enrollees that were referred to the Office of Enforcement for uh, further enforcement actions. In terms of uh, inspections by the Office of Enforcement and the regional water boards, uh, during the past fiscal year, 23 inspections were conducted by the regional water boards and our Office of Enforcement. 
and also they took 137 enforcement actions related to the general uh, order. Uh, we want to credit uh, the improvement in enforcement to the pr um, participation by the enrollee community. Uh, as you can see, for the past three years, they have been really active uh, participating in the program. Uh, also, um, that monthly email reminder has been received uh, in a very positive way by the enrollee community. Um, and also, um, we uh, provide as much compliance assistance on a daily basis as requested. Uh, we also believe that in order to uh, continue to improve compliance with the program, we need to continue uh, doing infor um, inspections throughout the state. Uh, uh, to date, 100, 100 plus uh, uh, inspections have been completed by the Office of Enforcement and uh, well, the regional water boards. Uh, again, we believe that more uh, inspections are necessary to improve the compliance with the program. In terms of uh, data availability and assistance, uh, in response to the monitoring and reporting program reissuance by, uh, by uh, the executive director, we upgraded um, many aspects of our database. We strive to make it more user-friendly, and also we developed a step-by-step -step guidance uh, document that is used by the release to report to the database. In addition to that, uh, we have developed uh, an SSO incident map that is available to the general public. And this map maps all the SSOs or sewer overflows that have been reported to the database since the inception of the program. Um, we also have other uh, reports that are, more, that are used to provide information on uh, the number of SSOs reported by particular enrollees, and also we provide uh, rate indices and comparisons uh, by uh, agency to agency. We also have all the raw data available on our website for anyone to access. And um, this, all this data availability, we believe, uh, supports uh, the goal of the, uh, strategic, the strategic plan by the State Water Board to provide uh, information related to water quality data on an easy easy way to understand to the general public. And again, we, we're striving to provide that information and we're always open to suggestions by anyone. With that, uh, that concludes my presentation on, on the program and uh, I'm gonna hand it up to Diana to complete. Okay, thank you. So in conclusion, I think we want to not only conclude with a few statements, but also ask the question, where do we go from here? So Victor presented you with our program that has a very high level of enrollment and we have permitting and enforcement program elements that are operating pretty efficiently. And with the next information item, as we have some regional board staff come up, um, you'll see that we have a lot of staff in place throughout the regions for this too. We're now in a good position with a large data set in our statewide database and experienced staff to pull this information and information that we have through the Division of Financial Assistance to identify systems that need further attention. Which systems have structural and capacity issues that are located in disadvantaged communities, which are impacting surface water quality, which are threatening our clean beaches, and public health and other beneficial uses. Also, what can be done for the coastal systems that will have capacity impacts due to sea, to sea level rise? So we are recommending that we coordinate with Division of Financial Assistance and with the regional boards. We look at future sanitary sewer funding needs. We use um, permitting, enforcement, and funding hand in hand. We use information that's coming forward through a lot of our contract researchers. I'm looking forward to um, one of the next items regarding beach pollutant source identification and actually put that information to use um, and look at the region specific information that all leads to um, not only quantifying how much um, spills are taking place, but actually addressing the issue to fix those systems. 
And so that completes this item, and we'd like to take you up on being able to uh, we go do to that, item 13, if possible. Yeah, we have a couple questions, but. Be before we do that, I, I was reminded that um, our item number 11, the next item that we're going to have is um, oh. we have a guest that has to catch a plane, oh. and so we uh, might want to not. I will renege on that offer, but stay tuned because you're very interested in that item as well. We understand. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Questions? I, just, I appreciate the forward-thinking comment at the end, Miss um, Messina. It's it's it is it's it's a good time for us to think integratively with you know this program and its issues with the public health and um, and all those beneficial uses. So I'll take that to heart. Right. I like the ditto. Helping. Yeah, ditto. You must have really liked this one. Yeah, no, it was terrific. I have to say, I told these guys I used to have to file public records requests to find this sort of information. So from a career arc, few decades, this is great. Thank you. Terrific. Let's move on then to item number 11. Yes, another information item. Uh, this is California Microbial Source Identification Manual. Um, and we have with us today Steve Weisberg from Squirp, and uh, Patricia Leary will be presenting the item. Okay. Is this on now? Yeah. Good afternoon, board members, Chairman Marcus, and other board members. My name is Patricia Leary. I'm with the Division of Financial Assistance. Um, the Clean Beaches Initiative Grant Program was started under the 2001 Budget Act in response to poor water quality and significant exceedances in fecal indicator bacteria at our beaches uh, revealed by the AB 411 monitoring. Funding for our program has been provided through Props 13, 40, 50, and 84. The Clean Beaches Program has provided about $100 million for about 100 projects to date. Typical implementation projects have included dry weather diversions of urban runoff to reduce or eliminate dry weather runoff to beaches, construction of stormwater disinfection facilities, sewer, septic, and beach restroom replacements and repairs, and creating natural runoff filtration areas. The CBI program has also funded innovative research projects to evaluate rapid methods to measure bacterial indicators epidemiology studies to evaluate illness rates in dry weather, development of microbial source tracking methods to discriminate between human and non-human sources using DNA markers found in fecal samples. While the CBI program has had success in improving water quality at some contaminated beaches, there are still many beaches that are chronically polluted with no identified fecal indicator bacteria source. Without knowing the source, we can't identify projects to fix them. The project we're here to discuss with you today is the completion of some really groundbreaking research to develop standard source identification protocols to identify bacteria sources that contribute to chronically impaired beaches. The project was funded using approximately $4 million of clean beach funds. The grantee was Squirp, and the research team included UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, and Stanford. A significant element of the project was to conduct a comprehensive methods evaluation to assess the performance of 41 methods to analyze microbial source tracking markers, and another significant element was to conduct source identification studies at four beaches, well actually four and a half. Um, the beaches included Cowell Beach in Santa Cruz, Arroyo Borough in Santa Barbara area, Topanga Beach in Los Angeles in the Malibu area, and Doheny Beach in Dana Point. Uh, and, they, and they also did some partial work at the city of Pacific Grove in the vicinity of Lover, Lover's Point. Additionally, the team working on the project has completed this source identification manual that does provide a protocol in order to identify the sources so that we can identify projects to fix it. We're close to ex executing some new CBI grants and have approximately $40 million left within our program to conduct additional source identification studies using the protocol and then additional implementation projects based on those studies. Just briefly before we start with Steve, I just wanted to mention that I have four staff 
that are here today that have worked very hard to make the program a success, and I'd love to introduce them to you if I could. Uh, on the left, we have Spencer Joplin, and then Rashid Eight Lossary, and Angie Norda, and Andrew Sue. And I want to mention also that sitting behind them are our very hardworking group of analysts who manage all of getting our executed agreements out, our deviations and invoicing and everything. And they include Wendy Westerman and Barbara Walton, Michelle Stebbins, Carolyn Stebbins. Are they always so color coordinated? Carolyn Saputo's here. <laughs> Michelle has left. <laughs> All right, so with that, Dr. Steve Weisberg Thanks. and Dr. John Griffith are here from SCORP to provide more information on the source identification project and the manual that was developed out of the effort, and I can certainly answer any questions when you get Yes, I, I do have a question before Steve begins. Oh, so you've got UCLA, you've got UC Santa Cruz, and we had UCLA. UC Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara and Stanford University. And Stanford. He had Lover's Point right there by Hopkins Marine Station. Yes, you know? I got to go visit my son so, there so many I'm times. Sorry. When he what was happened there. to UC Berkeley? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's wrong with this picture? You don't have a beach there that anybody... Oh, no, just kidding. Just kidding. I don't know about <laughs> this project now. <laughs> Ready for me, even though I'm not from Berkeley. Glad to see you. <laughs> so thank you. I'll start out by reiterating a lot of the points that, that Pat just made. Uh, you all have had a very successful program, the Clean Beach Initiative, given out a fair amount of funding. One of the things that your predecessors did a number of years ago to help that project along was to create something called a Clean Beach Task Force. It's about 20 subject area experts that you all have appointed to assist DFA in not only um, helping to cull what are the best projects to put forward, but also to work with um, the, the people who are doing these projects to essentially help them do those projects and, or help them develop their proposals for how to do those projects. And in fact, one of the people that you didn't mention, you're introducing people, was Leslie Loudon, who's been helping to oversee that Clean Beach Task Force for, for a long time. And, um, I've been on that task force, and I will tell you that um, uh, it was a lot easier at the beginning um, because we had a lot of low-hanging fruit. There were a lot of things that were very obvious, what the source was, and how to go about fixing it. Most of it were well, you had streams coming through that you could either divert or treat, or any of a number of things. The low hanging fruit are gone. And the problem that the program is having now is that the cities don't know what to put in as proposals because they don't know what problem they're trying to fix. Or they move to the ready, shoot, aim um, syndrome, where let's just try something without knowing for sure whether or not that is the problem. And so what we're starting to see is a lesser number of proposals come in and a lesser quality of those proposals coming in because they don't know how to figure out what the problem is. That's what, in a sense, presents an opportunity. Uh, microbial source identification or microbial source tracking has blossomed in the last decade. Um, you all know how genetic techniques have, have really grown. Uh, what's happened with this is that we've been able to not just look at is there enterococcus present, but what's the genetic signature of that enterococcus? Can we tie it back to a dog, to a cow, to a bird, to a human? And while the scientists are able to do this, um, you still have the beach manager. All right? There are lots of scientists out there saying, my method works best, my method works best. Um, which one should they be using? All right? And I will tell you that you've even had some funding, funding proposals where the cities have gone, and they're not just sure which one to use, and they don't necessarily pick the right one. And it's not just that. It's, it's how do you use these methods in combination? It's how do you use them in combination with other genetic methods? How do you use them in combination with the traditional methods, like diet testing or smoke testing, things that people have always used? And so what the task force suggested is that we create a team, even though it doesn't, doesn't include people from Berkeley, um, include a team that essentially develops the protocols that the cities could then use to develop, to better identify their sources, which will eventually then lead to better uh, proposals into the Clean Beach Initiative program. It also will help you all in the sense that you had some requirements under AB 538 to develop a source identification matter. What do you do when a beach is a problem? And you did some work on that, but you did it before these technologies were developed, and so it's, it's, uh, it's not relevant. So the, the game plan here is to develop something that can be used and fit that need. 
So this team was uh, selected, uh, and they had four major elements. The first was to do an evaluation study to figure out which methods really work. Uh, the second is to then take those methods and figure out how you're going to use them in combination and in combination with traditional methods by testing it at four high priority beaches, beaches that fall on the beach bummer list and, and are problematic. Can we prove, in a sense, the concept of how these can work? The third was then to learn from that exercise and develop a source manual, a source identification manual that not only defines the protocols but defines how to do it cost effectively. And then the last is, once we've got that, how do you go about training the laboratories? So those are the four elements. I'll give you about two minutes on each of those. First off, why a method evaluation study? There are many candidate methods out there. Which one do you use? And the problem is, is that most of the method developers, or most of the testing of these, are done by the people who develop the methods themselves. So not only do they have a vested interest, but um, they're typically doing it in limited geographic areas. So I have somebody who develops it in Florida, do the genetics of the cows in Florida transport to the genetics of cows in California? We don't know. Um, also, what they tend to do is they tend to look at it as, ah, I have a marker that, that identifies cows, but I haven't tested it against dogs and birds and other things. So yes, they might be uh, sensitive to cow, but it might not be specific to cow. Until you do it in a larger context, you don't know. And so we did an evaluative study that goes about trying to define how do we do this. The study, very simple, um, and John is in the back there. Uh, there isn't the back end of a cow he hasn't seen. Um, somebody has to go get these samples. What we did is we took 12 different types of samples. In fact, if you wanted something signed in my office, you had to fill a bucket. Um, we needed human fecal material for this one. What we did is we created 64 blind samples where we knew what fecal material was in the sample, but the researchers who were testing it did not. And so what we did is we would then send this out to, as you see up on the slide, 27 participating laboratories. We had virtually every leader in the field participate in the study, where we would send them blind samples. Some had human only, some had dog only, some had combinations. And they had to come back and then tell us uh, what was there. And not only did we ha send it to the original method developers of each of these, but we also had each of the four teams that, that were mentioned for the methods that were most prominent, they also ran those methods. So it wasn't just could the method developer do it, but could those methods be ported over to other scientists who have reasonable degree of competency, but weren't the original method developer? Is the method repeatable? Could it be used by others? I will tell you, as a scientist, I wish I had graphics for you, but I was told not to today, so you're going to get the endpoint answer, which is we had success, a lot of success, actually. Uh, we identified methods that you see the five sources up there that were both sensitive and specific. So sensitive meant that if it was there, you identified as being there. And specific is, if it wasn't there, you identified it as not being there. We had a bunch of methods that were very specific, but they weren't sensitive. So things like viruses, all right? If a, if a human virus was there, you knew it was a human sample, but half the samples, the, the density of virus isn't high enough. So it wasn't sensitive. We had others that were very sensitive, but they weren't as genetically specific to that type of critic. The idea was to find things that were both. And we did for five different sources. Not only those five sources, but we also have essentially statistics on other sources, uh, how well the methods work. So when I have one that's sensitive or specific, I can use it in that context. But the more important thing that we did is that we didn't just do a study ourselves. We brought in every top scientist who works in this to join us on this. And the, uh, and the key here is that if you're going to try and move these things forward, if you're going to make it part of, in a sense, a standardized protocol, you've got to have that scientific agreement. So we brought them in early to help design the study, because what we didn't want is some method developer who sat there and said, well, it didn't work because of the way you tested it, if you had tested it this way. We got them involved, so everybody bought into the design. We also didn't want them to say at the end, well, you interpreted it correctly, so we brought them all back to our place for three days. We gave them all the results, and we said, you tell us how you would interpret it. It was a fun three days trying to work it through, but we ended up agreeing. It got to the point that we have done so well at that, there's a whole special issue of the journal Water Research, a highly prominent journal, that dedicated an issue just to that study. Um, and we got this level of agreement. That level of agreement is rare in scientists, science, and it allowed us to move forward. When, so, will, when will that be out? Uh, the journal just came out. I even have a copy of my briefcase. Oh, good. OK. Um, it's out. John, okay. do, you, do you mind grabbing my briefcase there? Maybe. Copy. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> it's my only copy. Uh, I, I received an electronic copy through our library, so we could provide that. Um, but it's not enough. Thanks. Uh, I'm just maybe hand to the clerk. Um, pass that by. Um, it's not enough to just. Uh, so now I've got the laboratory techniques, but how do you use the laboratory techniques? Again, how do you put them in combination? So we did four case studies. And as you can see, each of the team members picked a location that we call the beach bummer location. When we have chronic problems, where exactly? It goes back to exactly the problem that CBI has is how do we go about fixing those beaches? We don't know what the problem is. Two goals, one, how do we apply it? Um, and then how do we, in fact, fix that beach? So again, trying to do the, the short answer, we had, again, a lot of success. And what was interesting is that you go into these beaches with what the locals think are the problem. And then you apply these methods, and it isn't always what they think. Um, and now we have techniques that allow us to essentially pinpoint that. So for instance, Cal Beach, that's uh, up in Santa Cruz. The, where the city was coming from on that one is we think the problem is regrowth of these enterococcus bacteria in the rack, all right? The, the, the beach, you know, the, the algal material, that, uh, the kelp material that comes up on the back serves as a regrowth opportunity. And their fix was focused on removing the BRAC from the beach. And in fact, there was some controversy between as to whether that's an ecologically good thing to do because it's habitat for different types of animals, um, whether it was really fixing the beach. Well, we went in there, we did our studies, and we found that the fecal, the, I mean, we did a number of studies looking at the spatial signatures and the temporal signatures. But in the end, these source markers told us there's a human signature to these things. It can't be just what's regrowing in the rack. And then we did a number of other studies, and we think we have pinpointed now um, some, some buried pipes where there might be some leakage. We won't know for sure until they go about fixing those pipes uh, and see if the problem ceases. But this is an example where we got people to work together, and the source identification techniques pointed us in a different direction than where everybody was. And we've got people agreeing. That's the direction they need, they need to pursue. Similarly, we went to Dahini. Uh, for those of you who've been to Dahini, there's a kind of a pond that exists at the base of the system. Lots and lots and lots of birds. And the thought process was, there's nothing we can do about this. It's all the birds pooping in the water. And they do. And they are a contributor. But we also found, again, a human signature. Right? And that led us to do a bunch of dye testing. And when we did that dye testing, we found where that stuff was coming out on the beach. And we wouldn't have known to test those particular pipes until we did the human signature. So that has now led to both the city doing some work, the, county, or the state parks people doing some work, and again, I think that beach, you're gonna see some market improvement. Doesn't mean, again, the difficulty is, it doesn't mean it's the only source, and I'm sure the birds will come into play as well, but this is an example where the source tracking really helped us pinpoint. Arroyo Burrows, another example. The thought process, there, there's a lot of dogs are allowed on the beach, and the thought process was the dogs are the problem. In fact, our source markers identified that the dogs were a problem. In fact, a pretty substantial part of the problem. But we didn't just take the dog markers at the beach, we took them into the streams coming into the beach. And it turns out there's more dogs in the upper watershed where people essentially take their dogs and let them um, go by where the water is than on the beach itself. On the beach itself, most people clean up after it. And so in a sense, it shifted you know, where you go about the, the action. So again, these are just examples of where the source tracking was able to work. And what we did, is throughout this, we, each of the teams kind of learned, how do you go about this? What are the things that produce the, the best, co the most cost-effective benefit? And we ended up deciding that there are a number of things that came out of it. First off, use a toolbox approach. It's not all about just using the genetic techniques. Everybody wants to run and use those because they're new, you know, they're, they're fun and you get, you get, but it's not just that. There's some traditional things that you need to do that are easier, more cost-effective. I mean, right off the bat, um, just look at the spatial characteristics. Uh, if, if I have high intercoccus here and low intercoccus here and high over here again, then I had another source coming in. You can look at those spatial patterns. You can look at the temporal patterns. But once you've narrowed those down, you can form some pretty specific hypotheses where to go, and that's where you start to bring in these new markets. The second thing that we learned is the simplest answer is often the right one. Start with the pipes. Draw maps. Put it into a GIS. Um, you'd be amazed how often you can tie it back to those kind of things. And the human material is more pathogenic than, say, bird material, so wouldn't you want to start with that? So these are the kind of lessons that we're, ca we're coming out of these exercises that we've captured. And then last one, and I think this is one that, that Pat was instrumental in helping us make happen, and 
pinged on us continuously, yet everyone in the room, because it's amazing how you have stormwater departments and beach departments and wastewater departments, and they don't always talk. You have city, you have county. You've got to get them all in the same room. You've got to kind of talk everything through. And you'd be amazed how often we found out about buried pipes that people hadn't worried about for 50 years. And in Doheny, that actually turned out to be one of the issues. So we captured all of that into a source identification manual. Um, and we wrote it with the idea, not of a how-to, I'm going to you know, do step one, step two, step three, for a scientist, but for a beach manager. How do I get started with this problem? Because in the end, the beach manager is going to tie in to a scientist who's likely going to run those protocols for them. It's how, what's the thought process? How do you get going with this? Step by step, how do you walk through? How do you think about this? What are the things you do first? And how do you, and, and the two key things that we put into this are one, make it hypothesis driven. Don't just say, I'm going to collect a bunch of data and figure out afterwards what's happened. Because that's how most of the source identification has been done. It's ungodly expensive, right? Instead, walk the watershed, identify what are the key possibilities and then do sampling that's targeted to answer yes or no to that hypothesis. It allows you to target your effort and answer the question more specifically. The second part is a phased approach. There are a lot of things you can do with cheap methods. I mentioned the kind of upstream downstream. If you think this is a possible source, go upstream and downstream. If you don't see a change, then why do I have to do a bunch of newfangled methods to answer what you can do with a simple thing? So all that's incorporated into the manual. The last part is technology transfer. The guidance document is a good start but somebody's got to learn how to do it. So we have done a number of things. We did a state of the science workshop. We brought in about 100 people to kind of walk them through. I see Michael Jurdy in the back. He holds a, he, uh, he called, holds a beach water quality work group meeting on a quarterly basis. I think we've been there two or three times to kind of talk to them about what we're doing as we go along. But the all culminated with an MST training course where we brought people in for three days. The first day was all about basics. How do you do source tracking in general? How do these genetic methods work. The second day was laboratory basics. The third day was specifics on the source tracking techniques. Not only that, but we followed this with proficiency testings. Um, and in fact, I, I mentioned that, I should have mentioned, I have a little slide here. These are the 14 groups that came to our training and are now trained in how to do all these methods. So a good cross-section of consulting firm, municipalities, stormwater programs, public health departments. Um, and as I say, we finished it with proficiency testing. And this, these groups have all done well. And I think we have some pretty good, not only methodologies, but standardization of application of those methodologies. And I guess I'll finish by saying one of the things that you all, I know in your public hearing a few days ago, uh, talked about is you're going to take over some of the responsibilities the Department of Public Health has, one of which is ELAP, the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. They do not yet have anything for how you determine whether or not a lab is capable of doing these source identification markers. We're standing by to try and help you with that as you take on those responsibilities. So with that, I'm glad to take any questions. I want to make sure someone tells Charlie, I'll try, I will try to remember, but we should tell Charlie about this because we started down this path when I first got onto the board, which about seven years ago, and uh, six or seven years ago. and. Um, it's happened. I cannot believe it. I really cannot believe right. it. And that's you're the only great. state in the nation that has this kind of guidance. EPA this is incredible. And, and that's not a function of we're that much better. It's just that you've all invested in us and to do it, and the timing is right. If you tried to do this seven years ago, the technology is just developing that rapidly, but it's now reached the point where the timing is right. So how much does it cost to actually run the samples in the lab? I mean, is it right. so to, do the, the to do it? has two pieces to it. It's got mm -hmm. the cost of each individual sample, and then it has the cost of how many samples do you need to run. And so it's hard to give you an answer um, uh, because you, it depends on the beach. If you have a single hypothesis, a single thing, it's simple. The cost of running an individual sample for a marker is on the order of about $100. Mm -hmm. But you don't typically run it once. You don't run it one time. You don't run it at one location. Uh, so I think historically, um, you, when DFA and others have been supporting these kind of source identification studies, they typically run half a million to a million dollars for doing an entire study. I think with these kind of source identification procedures that we have that really have focused things instead of the sample everything, I think that cost is going to come down a bunch. It's still, again, beef specific, um, but I think you're going to see costs now more in the two to $300,000 range uh, because of more efficient ways to go about it. 
If I may add, that's about the amount of money that I heard that Stanford did spend on the Cal Beach study. And um, the differences between some of the beaches, too, I think there's differences in the cost of doing it depending on whether the beach is a storm drain beach with sewers or a septic beach that has more diffuse sources because it's easier to work with a smaller stakeholder group of all the satellite collection agencies. And I believe it was really pretty straightforward to use the human HF-183 marker and evaluate at nodes moving up a storm drain and looking at the sanitary sewer collection system map at the same time, it really highlighted where the leaks were pretty effectively in those circumstances. I noticed you didn't report what happened at Topanga. Is that not conclusive? Um, I ran out of room on the slide. <laughs> oh, tell us, please. Um, Topanga is actually a very interesting one, um, and, I, and I think the answers are still coming in. That work is still ongoing. And I think this is a perfect example, actually, of where it's not a single source. You have all kinds of things upstream that are going on, but you also have other things that are going on the beach. And in fact, what happens there is we end up finding multiple pieces, multiple answers. And in reality, that's really what it is at these diffuse beaches. So for instance, I used Ohini as an example, and I said, you know, the original thought it was the birds. Somewhere along the line, you'll probably get back to doing something about the birds or just classifying that as natural and not worrying about it, because um, it is multiple things. But there were certain things that we were able to eliminate right away. Also, you know, with the different sources of fecal matter, there's, there's a differing risk, as you alluded to. Um, and I guess, I've, having gone through the manual, we didn't get into the risk assessment aspect as much as we could, I guess. Is that true? It, it wasn't the, the oh, main sure. focus of it. Uh -huh. It was just how to find it. Mm -hmm. but, but that's but part of our management. Right, but you did system. notice in the, in the document how we identified always focus on the human signatures first because that is where the greatest health risk. If you can solve that one, then the, things like the birds have a lesser health risk. You may want to solve those later. That's right, and I, I saw that actually, that emerged uh, operationally, and that, that's what's so refreshing about it. It's fa fairly user-friendly, really, to the beach manager, I, I felt. Yeah. I would also just like to note that this fits in with the um, uh, natural source exclusion approach that was adopted in Los Angeles and San Diego and is um, being considered for statewide applicability, so that when those were adopted, it was difficult to actually do that because you couldn't really eliminate um, human sources. Now it seems that we might have the tools to be able to identify and, and eliminate those sources and be able to make use of that regulatory tool. That's great. And a great great work, but also a really great presentation, even in the prep. It was like, I know there are a lot of words on the slides, but it was really well done in terms of having a sense of this and getting excited about it. So thank you. I, I can just envision places all over the country that are just, it, it, your phones are going to be ringing off the hook. And th so the, just make sure you still have time for us. Because uh, <laughs> Chesapeake Bay is calling, I know. So Great. Anything else? Thank you so much. That, was, that is very exciting. And now with, um, Craig, your indulgence, I want to move to item 13. Thank you all for joining. Thank you also for introducing the staff. I appreciated that. It's nice to see you all. Well, item 13 deals with a uh, follow-up to the cost of compliance resolution that was adopted last year. We were asked yeah. in January to come forward with uh, uh, to talk about the <laughs> different waste discharge requirements found in various sanitary sewer system uh, at the various regional boards. I see we have uh, Diana Messina and Norman Russell. And yes, I'll go ahead and introduce the rest of the folks here. So we do have Norman Russell. And um, also with us, we have Julie Chan and Jeremy Haas. They're from the San Diego Water Board. And they are going to be presenting with us. So thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Marcus and board members. I'm Diana Messina, Chief of the Surface Water Permitting Section in our Division of Water Quality. 
This item is our report to you regarding the staff evaluation addressing cost of compliance of sanitary sewer system requirements in our state. We work together with the different regional board staff and the Division of Financial Assistance to come together with the recommendations we have at the end of this presentation. Um, so as I mentioned, Julie will take over with some of the discussion when it comes to uh, the San Diego region and other Southern California issues. Oh. For, for our uh Folks on the web, maybe we should take that uh, nameplate away from where oh, you go. Oh, who there. am I? Okay. I'm Patricia Leary. I'd love to be known <laughs> as Patricia Leary. Okay. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this evaluation is in response to the State Board resolution adopted in 2013 that we refer to as the Cost of Compliance Resolution. This resolution directs our Water Board staff to take both short term and long term actions on reducing the cost of compliance of our permits while allowing agencies to focus their limited resources towards maintaining water quality protection. The resolution is based on principles of your 2011 resource realignment resolution and the corresponding report. These principles revolve around the basic question, where is the best place to direct our limited resources to get the most value out of protecting water quality? In addressing this question for sanitary sewer system requirements, the board resolved to reduce the frequency of reporting requirements when, no threats, when there's no threat to water quality. Uh, you also resolved to eliminate duplicative and overlapping overflow requirements for dischargers subject to both the statewide order and additional regional board orders. The resolution acknowledges the 2013 amendment to the statewide orders monitoring and reporting program. This amendment streamlines spill reporting when no spills occur, like Victor had explained in the previous presentation. The resolution specifically directs staff to evaluate and make recommendations on the appropriateness of additional regional board requirements placed on these statewide order enrollees. Before we go into detail, I'd like to touch basis on the statewide order again and point out that our order regulates public sanitary sewer systems greater than one mile in length. This order also allows regional water boards to place more stringent requirements to address region-specific water quality concerns. In our evaluation, we reviewed the basin plans, which are the water quality control plans for the nine regions, and we also reviewed the regional water board orders with the additional requirements for sewer overflows. As we worked with regional board staff, we evaluated the tangible water quality benefits resulting from the additional monitoring and reporting requirements. We also discussed the value of the additional information resulting from those additional requirements. When we reviewed the basin plans, we appropriately found prohibitions on sanitary sewer overflows. We can all agree that we don't want raw sewage overflowing out of collection systems. The basin plan prohibitions are in themselves not a cost of compliance concern because these prohibitions do not directly result in unnecessary requirements, and they're not related to the compliance cost issues. It's how a regional water board implements its basin plan through requirements and orders that affect the cost of compliance with regulation. As we look at all the regions, we find that four regions have additional requirements placed on the statewide permit enrollees but it is the Los Angeles Water Board and the San Diego Water Board that ended up being the focus of our evaluation. The first of the four regions with additional or duplicative requirements is the San Francisco Bay Water Board. That board issued individual NPDES permits to the East Bay Mud Utility District um, for their satellite collection systems. 
However, these permits are in direct response to a state water board order addressing concerns specifically to those systems. The Central Coast Water Board has additional individual orders that do overlap the statewide permit uh, and the requirements in the permit, and they are scheduled to rescind those orders in an upcoming board meeting. So the remainder of this presentation is on the additional requirements um, in the Los Angeles and San Diego Regional Board orders. Our evaluation pointed us in the direction of focus on the coastal regional water quality concerns. In fact, the last information item was quite timely and very interesting. In areas such as Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego, and also as we just heard, I guess going up north along the coast, um, there are these coastal issues when it comes to protection of public health. Um, in the Southern California urban area, there's dense urbanized and pervious areas which are adjacent to the beaches. The extensive storm drain systems drain either directly to the coast or to local surface water bodies draining to the coast. Both small and large sized spills travel with higher velocity and we know firsthand from continuing spill events that even small spills of a thousand gallons continue to result in beach closures and other impacts that threaten public health and the coastal tourism economy. The Los Angeles Water Board places additional requirements in NPDES permits which are issued to municipal wastewater agencies that are allowed to discharge treated wastewater to surface waters. Through these permits, the Los Angeles Board regulates spills of 1,000 gallons or greater or any volume reaching surface waters or shallow groundwater. The Los Angeles Board requires two-hour notification of a spill to both the Health Department and the Regional Water Board and a 24-hour and five-day report to the Regional Board for each spill. On top of that, an, an annual sewer overflow summary is, re, is a required deliverable in these permits. If this requirement is duplicative of another reporting requirement, the regional board staff lets the discharger know that they just want a copy of the same report, not to uh, prepare a different report solely for the regional board. The Los Angeles Water Board also requires water quality monitoring for spills for a lower minimum spill threshold of 1,000 gallons and requires shallow groundwater monitoring for these spills. The Los Angeles region maintains all their additional data in our California Integrated Water Quality Systems Database, also known as our CWICS database. This information on spills is available for formal enforcement and in the last three years, in addition to informal enforcement, this region has taken, um, has made several referrals to the Attorney General's office for further enforcement. And that's been based on um, lack of appropriate local funding to maintain systems, multiple spills, infrastructure deficiencies, and then system management deficiencies. Uh, I'm sorry, going back, and that would be going for back. spills from 1,000 to 50,000. Correct. All right. So our staff finding and recommendations for the additional Los Angeles Regional Board are as follows. We find that their water quality requ monitoring requirements are for a smaller spill threshold. And this lower threshold is directly related to coastal region dense urban development. And that the higher statewide threshold does not allow the regional board to regulate and enforce against direct impact to public health and local tourism. Even with these findings, however, we recommend that the Los Angeles board consider removal of spill monitoring, which is the monitoring of the actual sewage. And in talking to um, region 4, they, they are agreeing to this. Um, we, we know what is I'm, in... I'm not following that. What do you mean? Okay, so it's the monitoring of the actual sewage, not the monitoring of the receiving water body. Um, so they have them doing water quality monitoring on the actual sewage. Um, 
This doesn't bring any additional new information that we don't already know about raw sewage. We want to know the quantity that they estimate being released, but we really don't need to know that information. What we do recommend, though, is that they maintain the monitoring of the receiving waters and the tracing of where the sewage goes, because that is needed to determine the impacts for enforcement. Thank you for clarifying that. I saw your eyes just light up and it scared me. <laughs> for the additional monitoring requirements on shallow groundwater, we recommend that the Los Angeles Board retain this monitoring for spills to soil that are in close proximity to surface waters impacted by bacteria or near areas of high recreational use but that they consider removal of these monitoring requirements outside of those areas. This all needs further evaluation, however, of current information and the phasing in of changes to ensure public health is not jeopardized. Right, so water body impacted by bacteria, I mean, oh, I just, I'm sorry, I'm just not close enough this time. Um, but there are some areas in LA that rely on groundwater, so it's not just about surface water, right? Correct but they're focusing solely on the shallow, um, the shallow groundwater. That in theory people aren't using for groundwater? For drinking. In theory. In theory. Right, but in practice. Um, right, I it, could sometimes not answer it, that. Right, but I mean, that's just, I just don't cut it too fine is all I'm saying yes. because there are places that have what you would call an illegal well just because people are poor and they didn't do it right and so they could be, but you can't assume that they're doing it I just would rather be on public health. We should be more careful. That's Absolutely. All. Comment well noted. Thank you. Yep, That's a good comment. And yet I think there's a, a, a grander context in the shallow groundwater world in urban areas because it's crisscrossed with sewer trenches everywhere. And there's never been an, uh, a watertight sewer ever built. And so as such, there is a kind of a chronic exfiltration reality that all sewer systems reckon with so that we don't want to overstep you know and overstate the risk to shallow groundwater right and um, the Los Angeles Water Board staff really emphasize that if there are changes there won't be changes immediately they would need to phase in changes because they need to assure that the public health is protected so at this point I'm going to hand the mic over to Julie Chan Hi, good afternoon. I'm Julie Chan, and I have the uh, regional SSO WDRs in my branch. Um, I've actually had this program for three months, so I'm glad to have Jeremy Haas by my side, who has deeper institutional knowledge of my program, and I'll probably direct any of your questions to him. Um, I c I'm invited to participate uh, because uh, basically we agree with your staff's recommendations, so I'm comfortable presenting them. We adopted our current order in 2007, but we adopted our first uh, collection system overflow WDR in 1996. And when I saw on the uh, previous item that San Diego did not come up as one of the state's either number of spills or volume of spills top three, I was really pleased and I hope that reflects the maturity of our program in San Diego. Um, as depicted on the slide, we have three things in our order um, that are considered additional to the state board's order. The first is a prohibition on all uh, sewer overflows to waters of the state. Um, it's interesting, we like to use the term waters of the state because we have a lot of spills into dry canyons and we end up in a lot of arguments with discharges over whether those are surface waters or even waters of the U.S. But it's water of the state. It, it's, we spend a lot fewer resources arguing over whether or not it's a violation. Um, so that's an important uh, prohibition that we have in our, in our WDRs. Um, the second one is, uh, requires 24-hour notification to the regional board. Uh, as you'll see, the, the recommendation is to get rid of this, which we agree with. It's kind of a no-brainer since uh, these spills are reported to the California Office of Emergency Services within 24 hours. Um, so that's, that one's a good one. But the last one, which we've had quite a bit of uh, discussion with your DWQ staff, is on our mandatory reporting requirement 
for private lateral sewer overflows, and this is re uh, required of the wastewater agencies. This is a cost of compliance issue, so uh, the things that we're addressing here are what is the value of the reporting and what's the cost of the reporting. And I should say uh, the value of mandatory versus voluntary because, as you know, the state order, the state board's order, has voluntary reporting of private lateral spills. We have mandatory reporting. Um, in our briefings, we talked a lot about the value, and I know the hour is late, so I won't you know, repeat the whole discussion other than to say that um, our stakeholders, uh, cities, um, even um, CASA has testified on the value of private lateral spill reporting. We have concerns that moving to um, voluntary is, is going to um, lead to questions being raised on the value of the data because we fear that a voluntary, a voluntary requirement, <laughs> voluntary reporting is going to result in underreporting. And when you have underreporting, the value of the data um, isn't as high. Um, I don't think there's a question that private lateral spills are a public health concern. Um, and I think um, it, uh, in the squirp item, they didn't talk about the pipes that were leaking at Doheny Beach, but I understand that some of those were private laterals. Um, I believe one was at the state park. Um, near the beach and um, so the um, in the um, the over 10 years of our program the, uh, the value one of the biggest values of private lateral spill reporting by the uh, sewering agencies is that um, we've used it to shine a bright light on the project problem to get the sewering agencies to work with the MS4 agencies to do more to first prevent and second respond. And I mentioned that in our MS4 permits, our co-permittees are required to enter into agreements with sewering agencies about how they will respond to private lateral spills. The private lateral spill reporting is the hook that we have into the sewering agencies to get them to work with the MS4 agencies because agreements have to go both ways and the sewering agencies have to be motivated to work with the MS4 agencies. And we've, we've really seen changes um, in um, the 14 years of this program. My colleague, David Barker, who isn't here today, but who uh, had this program, told me stories of uh, in the 1990s when a private lateral would spill and the city of San Diego would stand by and let it go on and on and on unabated and do nothing uh, while the the regional board you know, tried to work with a, a public agency or the health department to get something done. Um, I can also tell you that two years ago, Dave's lateral went bad. <laughs> His toilet backed up and the plumber came out and he had a tree root uh, that had grown into his private lateral all the way into the city's main. They ended up calling the city because they didn't want to just push the tree roots into the main, but once that tree root is in the main, the city has liability. Dave said they came out the next day, dug up his lawn, replaced his lateral, cleaned out the main, and didn't charge him anything. So, I mean, this, these are the kind of changes that, that we've seen. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> oh, here we go. I went, uh, I went on talking. Uh, so this slide, you know, summarizes the main points that we wanted to make about keeping our mandatory private lateral spill reporting requirement in our permit. Um, we would also retain our, our prohibition against all sewer overflows into waters of the state and remove the 24-hour notification to uh, um, anyway, that, that required reporting. And I think I'll wrap up there. And if you have any questions, we have to take them. If you don't have questions of Julie, I'll wrap up the, the staff presentation. Go ahead and wrap up. We may come back to Julie. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have some overall um, conclusions. Before I show them to you, I, I just want to say it's, it's amazing the information that comes forward once we start talking with each other. And so it's just been a pleasure working with the regional board staff and the different state board staff um, on this. And we'll continue doing this for the cost of compliance issue with other uh, permitting programs. 
we find that the regional boards do want to make the changes that address the cost of compliance as long as they do not compromise water quality. Um, we do find, however, that the region-specific conditions do warrant region-specific requirements. Some boards are implementing these additional requirements as allowed by the statewide general order. We are seeing inconsistency, though, along the, um, the coast where we're seeing these issues with the different coastal regional boards. Um, in addition, the larger number of enforcement actions that the regional water boards have been sharing with us, um, we're having a hard time quantifying the water quality benefits due to the enforcement actions. But we do conclude that there's a positive deterrent effect that these reporting requirements have. And that raises the awareness of this really serious issue of sewage spills. And it seems to be actually reducing spills, like Julie has, has mentioned. We have identified duplicative reporting that is not useful and we believe should be removed. And also water quality monitoring that may not be necessary. There we go. So our recommendation is that the regional boards keep the additional requirements linked to region-specific health concerns. Um, remove the monitoring for overflow that does not pose a public health threat. Remove the monitoring that does not provide a basis for follow-up enforcement. Remove duplicative reporting for information that is found in our CWIC system due to the statewide order. And we all need to start using this data that we have in our statewide, uh, that our statewide program and the additional regional requirements have brought forth. Um, whether it's for increased enforcement action that, in, that leads to improved sewer systems or to help you as the state water board on what your next steps are. Um, with this, we would also would recommend that we pull in the research findings from SCORP and the other entities that we're, we're paying some good money for. <laughs> So our staff recommendations here is for the next time you revisit the statewide order to update it. Um, we recommend that we use the information the San Diego Water Board has brought in for your consideration of possibly adding reporting requirements for private laterals, especially the larger ones. We recommend that we fine tune the requirements in the statewide order per water quality threat. So for example, look to see if we can further minimize the requirements for overflows within that 95% category that Victor was speaking to earlier. That does not pose, they do not pose a threat to the beneficial uses. But to establish unique requirements to address the larger sewer overflows to surface waters or those that actually do make a serious impact. Yes. I ask a question. When you say the minimal overflows to surface water, how would you define a minimal? How would it be minimal? I, I remember when the public health department felt that a thimbleful of sewage was worth closing a beach, so I'm having trouble figuring out what a minimal spill is. I think the idea is that um, uh, around recommendation number two is that we have 95% of our enrollees who are performing pretty well. Mm -hmm. We got 5% responsible for 90% of the sewage that goes surface water. So another cost of compliance um, effort we can undertake would be to, to take and um, maybe revisit the general order and um, relax the requirements, if you will, uh, in terms of um, uh, reporting further for those 95%. And then focus our attention on the 5% of, of folks who are spilling the most and give them some enhanced requirements, maybe outside the general order. So, so that, th that's the, the, the basic uh,